Hello everyone. My name is Aman Gupta and I work for the multimedia search team at LinkedIn. I work on various applications in, for image and video understanding. So far, we have talked about uh, different networks and we have realized that deeper and bigger networks provide higher accuracy on ImageNet, which is an important benchmark for image classification. But can we avoid network engineering and search for an optimal architecture using a principled approach? This is the question NASNet answers, and NASNet leverages the network architecture search framework to design a convolutional architecture that performs well on ImageNet. So the overall architecture for NASNet is predetermined, and you can see this on the right, that for CIFR 10 and ImageNet, uh, the authors predetermine what the architecture looks like. However, in the architecture, there are two kinds of cells. One is normal cell and the other is reduction cell. The normal cells do not reduce the dimensionality of the input data, whereas the reduction cells do that. And what can change in these architectures is what the cells consist of. And these, uh, this search of what the, what the cells look like is done on CIFR 10. And this is applied on a larger data set ImageNet because that is more efficient. And as you can see in this architecture, the normal cells, the number of normal cells can vary and, uh, and the variable use is N. And this can be a hyperparameter for experiments. So how does NASNet search for the best performance cells? So it leverages a controlled RNN which predicts an architecture A from a search space with probability B. On this architecture, a child network is trained to get convergence with validation accuracy R. And then using R, the gradient of P is scaled and the controller is updated. And then the controller can be used to sample another architecture A. Using this search algorithm, uh, the authors found these two architectures to be the best performing architectures for the normal cell and the reduction cell. And as you can see here, the normal cell and the reduction cell both depend on a variety of uh, different kinds of convolutions and uh, addition operations. Using uh, NASNet, uh, the authors find three most performance uh, performant architectures called NASNet A, NASNet B and NASNet C. And in these two figures, you can see that NASNet outperforms almost all comparable networks, in, including all inception kind of networks and ResNets and variants. On the left, the X axis refers to multiply and addition operations in the millions. And the Y, y axis is accuracy, which is precision at one. And you can see different variants of NASNet A outperform all other algorithms. And in the brackets for the different variants, uh, the first number refers to N, the number of normal cells, and the second number refers to the number of channels in the last but one layer. And the same story is repeated when you change the X axis to the number of parameters in the millions. And you can see NASNet, again, outperforms networks like ResNet and other variants, and also all inception networks. This was one of the first popular examples of convolutional networks that uh, are built using some kind of architecture search. Now let's talk about a different kind of network which are very popular these days called efficient net. Now we already discussed that deeper and bigger networks provide higher accuracy on image net. But training and inference on these bigger networks is very expensive. It's expensive because training takes more time and if inference takes a lot of time, that can actually be prohibitive for applications. Especially at LinkedIn, we uh, use image features in our feed and other applications which are time sensitive and running inference on image data is act in time is actually very important. So the idea is, can we increase the efficiency of these networks while maintaining or even improving accuracy? And this is the question efficient net, uh, efficient nets answer and they balance and scale the following dimensions to get more efficient networks. These dimensions are the depth of the network, the width of the network, and the resolution used by the network. 
So this is a diagram from the paper. On the left, you can see a baseline network, which uh, has takes in a resolution of H cross W, and subsequently uh, it uses different layers, and the width at the top refers to the number of channels. So how can you scale such a network? In B, you can make it wider, increase the number of channels. In C, you can make it deeper, as you know a lot of ResNet architectures do, where ResNet 101 is less deep than ResNet 1000. And D, you can increase the resolution uh, of, of the input to each layer. Now, what the authors claim is that doing B, C, and D individually is not very effective, but doing them in conjunction with each other is uh, actually quite effective. And that's what they leverage for efficient nets. This is one more example of uh, scaling each dimension width, uh, depth, and resolution individually. As you can see, if you increase the width only for a network, then at some point your accuracy starts saturating at 80%. And the same story repeats for depth and resolution as well. So the authors claim that why not scale these three in conjunction with each other, which makes sense because if an image has a higher resolution, then probably a deeper and wider network will also help in classifying or understanding that image. So using some kind of a compound scaling factor, the authors create different variants of efficient nets. And these are titled efficient net B0 through B7, although more have been created by uh, other researchers. And B0 is the lightest network. And as you can see, it achieves a 77.3% accuracy on the ImageNet benchmark. And as you go up to image uh, efficient net B7, the accuracy keeps going up because it's a more involved and more uh, complex network. These are some result comparisons to other uh, architectures like ResNet, uh, NASNets, and Amoeba Nets. And on the left, you can see that the x-axis is flops, and efficient nets uh, by far outperform everything uh, else. And efficient net B6 in this case achieves about 85, 84 to 85% accuracy and is still lighter than a lot of other architectures in terms of flops. And the same story repeats for comparing efficient nets uh, to other networks in terms of the number of parameters. You can see that efficient net B4 and B5, which actually have an order of magnitude lesser parameters than uh, networks of comparable performance, uh, are actually pretty efficient and can be used practically uh, for tasks like uh, fast inference. One interesting thing, uh, thing to note here is that all the ResNets and Inception Net uh, architectures perform considerably worse when you fix the number of parameters, meaning that efficient nets provide a huge boost in performance if you are looking for a smaller network. So this was about NASNet and efficient net. Now let's switch gears and talk about transfer learning. So the underlying assumption about transfer learning is that the prediction for di different image tasks uh, is tied together. And the motivation is that if you have a model train on a certain data set or a certain task, can it be leveraged for another task? And the practical use cases uh, of, of this include using a pre-trained CNN as a feature extractor or fine tuning a pre-trained CNN on a different task. So this is an interesting exper experiment done by Yusinski et al in their paper where they take ImageNet data and classify and randomly partition it into data set A and B. And on the right, you can see that they train a seven or eight layer network, first only on A, and the second row only on B. And in the third row, they uh, specify B and B experiments where they train first on B, and then they freeze the first N layers, and they release the last eight minus N layers. So B3B means, freezing the first three layers and then training again the last five layers on B data set. And similarly, B and B plus means that you fine tune the first N layers and completely uh, release, uh, completely train the rest of the layers. And finally, A and B plus means you train on A first, then fine tune the first N layers and train the last eight minus one N layers on B data set. So this covers a lot of different uh, uh, settings for transfer learning. And the results are quite interesting. And uh, you can see 
that on the right in the x-axis is, uh, you know, if, if you look at number three, that, that means the first three layers are uh, under consideration for locking or, or not locking. And if you look at zero, that's a baseline network. Uh, there are five dots there because of five uh, different data set splits. And as you progress through the x-axis, that means you are either locking or not locking the network. The best performing architecture here is transfer A and B plus. That means you train on A and then you fine tune the first N layers on uh, B data set and train the rest eight minus N. And surprisingly, this transfer plus fine tuning is the most performant and the intuition here is uh, transferring and fine tuning improves generalization. The behavior for A and B is quite uh, interesting as well. And you can see that if you lock the first N layers and only train the last eight minus N layers, as N increases, the performance starts degrading. So this sheds some light on how transfer learning can be used uh, using pre-trained CNNs. Now let's talk about deep metric learning. The motivation for deep metric learning, uh, especially for images, uh, include a lot of use cases, but one such use case is facial verification. That instead of uh, classifying, uh, using this as classification task, we can learn a metric such that two images that should belong to the same person or are semantically similar should be close to each other in the final embedding space. Now, in this case, you can see that there are uh, images of different people from different angles but the distance between the images should correspond to whether these images are of the same person or not. For example, uh, the image on the top left and the, right, and the one right below it uh, are from similar uh, vantage points, but the images in the second row actually belong to the same person. And this is what we want to learn in metric learning. So one uh, practical architecture for metric learning is using Siamese networks where two images are input to a convolutional network and a label Y specifies whether the images are of an imposter or they're genuine. So you can supply pairs of images where sometimes the pair consists of images for the same person and sometimes they consist of pairs for uh, of, of different people. And this is where you can uh, make the network figure out whether the images belong to the same person or not. Another popular paradigm, which we will revisit in video understanding as well, is triplet loss. So given three data points, one is anchor, one is positive, one, and the other is negative, we uh, here specify that the anchor and positive belong to the same class, uh, but the anchor and negative uh, do not belong to the same class. Uh, so what we want to learn here is that the relative distance between the anchor and the positive should be uh, not very high, but the distance between the anchor and the negative should be higher than the distance between the anchor and positive. And this is reflected in the loss function here, where if you see the distance between anchor and positive, uh, subtract from that the distance between the anchor and negative, and add a hyperparameter alpha to it, we, if this is positive, uh, that means that uh, there is the loss is non-zero, and the network should push out net, uh, negatives farther away. And these triplets can be created for uh, facial verification or for various use cases like product identification or similar uh, practical uh, e-commerce tasks as well. Now let's quickly talk about visual lingual representations. Especially at LinkedIn, we have a lot of data of, our, of images and videos uh, accompanied by text. This includes title, descriptions, commentary uh, around uh, videos and images. And it's important to uh, leverage both visual and linguistic signals uh, in order to learn effective representations of uh, multimedia data. Now, recent visual lingual representations are inspired from the BERT architecture, which we'll talk about in a minute. And uh, some examples include BillBERT, VLBERT, and LXBERT. So BERT uh, was introduced in the year 2018. Uh, 2017 uh, was the year when transformers were introduced. And BERT is based on the transformer architecture, uh, which is an important architecture uh, for language understanding. And in the BERT architecture, you have an encoder uh, and a decoder. And uh, the encoder consists of stack layers, uh, such that you have a multi-headed attention followed by a feed-forward layer in each, uh, each, each layer. And this uh, architecture is pre-trained on proxy language understanding tasks, and then can be fine-tuned for specific tasks. 
and uh, variants of BERT and transformers are now very popular for language understanding tasks. Similar to BERT, uh, Wilbert is an example of an architecture that is extended to the multimodal use case that it can process both visual and textual inputs. And both inputs interact with each other through co-attentional transformer layers. And similar to BERT, it is pre-trained on proxy tasks. And this uh, trained architecture is then transferable to multiple visual input tasks. One, a few examples of the utility of Wilbert include visually grounded linguistic representations. So you can learn uh, word embeddings and linguistic representations that are grounded in the images that accompany this, this text. It can be used for visual question answering. It can also be used for tasks like caption-based image retrieval. Where given uh, expression, we can retrieve images that match uh, to that description. To, to summarize, image representations have evolved from pre computed to deep CNN based features. And the parameter versus efficiency trade off is quite important for CNNs, and especially for use cases at LinkedIn. We really care about inference speed and model serving. Transfer learning is an important technique to share network parameters across tasks and leveraging pre-training on uh, some, some networks uh, and then fine tuning on another task to improve generalization. Metric learning is an also a powerful technique to push images into an embedding space where the distance between the images corresponds to some semantic notion of similarity. Finally, for uh, social networks like LinkedIn, Visual lingual representations uh, can be quite powerful and help visual grounding of language and vice versa uh, for our use cases. Now let's talk about unsupervised and self-supervised learning. In previous sections, we discussed various image understanding tasks in the context of supervised learning. Now, supervised learning works, but is expensive because labels for this kind of learning are hard to come by. However, there's plenty of unlabeled data always available. And especially at LinkedIn, we have a large amount of data uploaded by our members that can be leveraged to improve our image understanding systems. This is important to improve the accuracy and the robustness of these systems. So let's talk about some recent works that build on unsupervised and self-supervised learning. One such work is momentum contrast for unsupervised visual representation learning. In this work, the authors work on image data sets and build dynamic visual dictionaries using a queue and a moving average encoder. And the dictionary in this setup is evolved very slowly. And the gradients are updated only for the encoder, allowing the dictionary to be very consistent across different changes apply to the encoder. And this kind of representation learning is done on a pretext task and is competitive on object detection and segmentation tasks when compared to similar work. Another interesting work in this domain is self-training using noisy student. In this setup, uh, there is a teacher model trained on a label data set and this teacher model is trained on uh, not a very large amount of label data. And this uh, model is then used to infer pseudo labels on unlabeled data. Now this unlabeled data set can be very large in comparison to the labeled data set. Now a student model is trained on this combined unlabeled data with pseudo labels and the labeled data and is trained with noise. Now the crucial difference between this setup and traditional teacher student models is that the student model here is equal or larger than the teacher model. And then the cycle is repeated by making the student a new teacher. And the authors train on the ImageNet data set and generate pseudo labels on a much, much larger data set. And they achieve state of the art accuracy on the ImageNet data set. On the left, you can see the red snake is noisy student training on top of EfficientNet. And you can see with EfficientNet B7, they achieve the highest accuracy. On the right, you can see that they increase robustness by improving classification accuracy on the ImageNet A dataset, which, is, which consists of difficult to classify images. 
So in uh, so overall, the authors improved the state of the art on ImageNet A by a considerable margin. Now I'll hand over to the next presenter who will talk about video understanding. 